Hi, and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases, and UK true crime. Today, we're going to be discussing one of two disappearances that are regularly talked about together, despite happening in two completely different counties. Jeanette Tate and April Fab, both 13 years old, disappeared from Devon and Norfolk almost 10 years apart. However, the manner and circumstance of their disappearances have always led people to wonder, were they in any way connected? Today, we're going to be exploring Jeanette's disappearance, and in the next episode, we will delve into April's. Thank you to Teresa for suggesting these cases. This episode contains descriptions about child abductions and murders that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. On the 19th of August 1978, two teenage girls, Margaret Heavey and Tracy Pratt, were walking along Withan Lane in the village of Aylesbury in Devon, eight miles from the city of Exeter. Aylesbury is a small village with a population of only a few hundred. It's a rural village with many of its surroundings being fields and farmland, with village life revolving around the local pub and the church. The two girls were walking up the lane when they saw a bike lying in the road. The bicycle was known to them. It belonged to one of their friends, 13-year-old Jeanette Tate. Jeanette wasn't with her bike. It was simply lay on its side with a pile of newspapers spilling out of the basket and onto the floor. Margaret and Tracy knew that it was Jeanette's bike. They had only just seen her and spoke to her around 10 minutes prior to this on that same lane. Jeanette had picked up some papers from the White Horse pub in the village and had just started her paper round, delivering around 14 when they'd bumped into her. They walked with her up the lane for a while with Jeanette pushing the bike before she got back on and rode off to continue her round. They saw her ride off and out of sight. Margaret and Tracy had continued up the lane walking and didn't think much else of it until they came across the bike. The girls picked it up off the floor and began pushing it up the lane and shouting for Jeanette into the hedgerows and the fields beyond. There was no answer and Jeanette was nowhere to be found. This was odd considering they had just seen her and she was meant to be doing her paper round. Why had she left the bike and the papers behind? Margaret and Tracy decided the best thing to do would be to go to Jeanette's house and speak to her dad. Jeanette lived at Barton Farm Cottage, just off Withan Lane, with her father John and his wife Violet, along with Violet's teenage daughter Tanya. Margaret and Tracy pushed Jeanette's bike to her house and knocked on, telling John that they'd found the bike in the lane, but they couldn't see Jeanette anywhere. John decided to go back to the lane with the girls and they did much the same thing that they already had. They called for her and searched the surroundings, but as before, they couldn't find her. This was now a worry for John and his family, as it now didn't appear that Jeanette had just nipped off the lane for some reason and would be back to collect her bike. It appeared that she wasn't anywhere nearby. John later told Devon Live about that moment. He stated, Jeanette's friends came up the road to say that they couldn't find Jeanette anywhere and they were pushing her bicycle. I went back with them to the lane to see where they had last seen her. They'd all started looking by then. They were jumping over hedges shouting her name and all sorts. After a very short time, Violet said, John, I think we better call the police. This is exactly what John did and Jeanette was now officially a missing person. Police would learn that Jeanette's day up until her disappearance had been entirely normal according to her family. It was a usual Saturday for her, and John would later explain that he had got up that morning with a sore throat. He left the house at around 7.30am and took Violet to work. At the time, she worked at a hospital in Exeter. He made a doctor's appointment which he attended for his sore throat, and he was back home by 10am to make the girls some breakfast. Later on, Tanya and Jeanette went to the shop to get some sweets. Tanya was due to go on holiday to Cornwall to see her father for two weeks, and John had agreed to drop her and her boyfriend off in Exeter to board a coach. 
He would say that they set off from the house at around 12.20 that dinner time and that Jeanette stayed at home by herself. The last time John saw her, she was playing with her puzzle books. Jeanette had agreed to do the paper round that afternoon as the usual paper boy had not been doing the round for a week as he had something else to do. She had taken on his round while he was off and this was the last day that she would be doing it. She set off sometime after 2pm that afternoon to the White Horse pub where she collected the papers from. She picked them up at around 3pm that afternoon. The route took her down Withan Lane then onto the A3052, a busy main road which ran from Exeter to the seaside town of Sidmouth. After she had collected the papers, she went back the same way and on to Withan Lane. This is where Margaret and Tracy saw her after she had just started her round. This is also where they found Jeanette's bike abandoned around 3.27pm, about two-thirds of the way up the lane. Jeanette's family couldn't understand what had happened to her. How had she just disappeared? They described her as curious about the world and a girl who loved animals and school. She wrote poetry and was amazing at maths. Ginny, as her family called her, was just a normal 13-year-old girl who had set out that day to do a paper round. Where had she gone? By all accounts, following John Tate's missing person report, Devon and Cornwall police immediately made a plan to search for her. It was taken seriously from the beginning, with officers being sent out to Aylesbury to search the area. Like Jeanette's family, the police were unsure what exactly had happened and where she had gone, so they acted accordingly. A base was established at the village hall and searches began in the area around the lane for any evidence. An RAF search was conducted, along with a rescue helicopter being sent out to also look for Jeanette. Officers canvassed the area, asking locals if they'd seen anything that day, and trying to track down anyone that may have seen Jeanette or anything else suspicious. Margaret and Trace's accounts were obviously crucial to the investigation, and they recounted what they had seen. They had been walking with Jeanette on Withan Lane when she had decided to ride her bike and continue on with her paper round. They had carried on walking on the lane reading a newspaper that Jeanette had given them. It was a few minutes later, just after half three that afternoon, that they had found her bicycle in the middle of the road and started to search for Jeanette. Officers also interviewed John Tate and asked him to account for his movements. John told them that he'd picked Violet up from work that afternoon in Exeter after dropping Tanya at the coach station and they'd spent some time there running a few errands, including popping into Dingle's department store to exchange a plate that had broken and getting an ice cream. It was when they arrived home that they were alerted to what had happened. Officers did check this alibi and staff at the department store confirmed that they had seen him there. Interviewing those close to Jeanette was important. They were treating her disappearance as an abduction from very near the start of the investigation, due to the odd circumstances in which she disappeared, and the fact that she had not been located soon afterwards. John Tate told Devon Live about being interviewed. He said, I had to have an alibi the same as everyone else, and they were satisfied with where I'd been and what I said I'd done. The interviews with those close to her and the friends gave them some details, however they didn't have much to go on. It seemed that Jeanette had just disappeared, and their main priority in the initial stages of the investigation was to try and find her. It's reported that officers descended on the area with police covering all local areas and looking through fields and farmland. The search for Jeanette had already started to gain some media attention and police appealed to the public to come forward if they'd seen Jeanette or anything else that day in Aylesbury. They produced posters with her photograph on and distributed her description out to neighbouring police forces and areas. Jeanette was described as around five feet tall with dark, close-styled brown hair and had been wearing a white t-shirt with her name Jeanette embroidered on the left shoulder and she also wore white plimsolls. Jeanette's family helped search that Saturday night and looked everywhere they could think of for her. Along with the police and other locals, they cast their net out across the village to try and track her down. 
Despite the searches and huge amount of manpower that was used in the first two days of Jeanette's disappearance, they still had not found her, and police were beginning to believe that something sinister might have happened. By this time, media interest had ramped up, and now national as well as local newspapers were reporting on Jeanette's disappearance. Detective Chief Superintendent Proven Sharp, who was head of Devon and Cornwall CID at the time, made a statement to the press on the 21st of August, stating, This is on the scale of a murder hunt, but we are keeping an open mind. There were a number of things hindering the investigation. There was no indication where Jeanette may have gone, there were limited witnesses to her possible abduction, and the scene had been altered after she had gone missing. This last part had been unintentional on the part of Margaret and Tracy, who had picked up Jeanette's bike in order to take it to her father's house. At this point they were unaware that anything sinister had happened to her and simply thought they were doing the right thing. When the police arrived at the scene, however, they didn't know exactly how the bike or the scene around it had been left, and this did affect how they might have investigated it. Detective Superintendent Mike Walsh, who worked on the investigation, told Devon Live many years after Jeanette's disappearance. The disappointing thing was, before it was reported at all to any police, the girls had moved the bicycle from the lane. So in other words, the actual scene had been tampered with. You know, it may have been a drawback that the scene had been tampered with before the job ever got reported. With a lack of answers and the hours ticking by, police were desperate to find any new leads. Sadly, it was becoming less and less likely that they might find Jeanette alive and well. They were faced with the facts that she had disappeared just a few minutes after leaving two of her friends only around 400 yards down the road in broad daylight. How had this happened? Margaret and Tracy are reported in one of the newspapers at the time, stating, If she had been attacked and screamed, I'm sure we would have heard. Over 48 hours passed in Jeanette's missing person investigation, and sadly Jeanette, or any sign of her, had not been recovered by the police. The first two days of a missing person inquiry are very important, and as they had not found her, police turned to other methods to jog the public's memory. A reconstruction of Jeanette's day was carried out by police in an effort to try and drum up some new leads. It is reported that Jeanette's best friend Amanda was asked to be Jeanette in this reconstruction and rode her bicycle down Withen Lane as she had done that day. She wore similar clothes to those that she'd worn and it's believed that she looked very much like Jeanette. In this reconstruction she stopped to chat to two friends as they knew happened that day and then rode onto the spot where her bicycle was found. Along with this reconstruction, the police once again appealed to the public for information. Detective Chief Superintendent Eric Rundle was leading the inquiry, and he told the press, We just hope that this reconstruction will jog someone's memory and help solve this strange mystery. The media continued to report on Jeanette's disappearance, and there was a real sense that everyone desperately wanted to find any trace of her. Appeals were made to the public for anyone that had been in the area that day that might have seen something, and the media attention did eventually pay off for the investigation. It's reported that a woman named Matilda Rogers came forward with information. Mrs Rogers lived in Hull, however on the day that Jeanette went missing she had been holidaying in Devon, and in Aylesbury specifically. She was there with her 14-year-old daughter Gail, and they were staying at a cottage on Withen Lane. Matilda stated that she and her daughter had been walking along Withen Lane on the 19th of August, the day that Jeanette went missing. They'd been walking from Aylesbury towards their cottage and had seen Jeanette, Margaret and Tracy at the bridge and going in the opposite direction to them. They carried on along the road towards their cottage and the girls went in the other direction. However, as they continued on, they spotted something else. Matilda reported that she saw a man driving a maroon car past them on the lane as they were walking. The car was heading in the direction that the three girls had gone. This information was immediately taken up by the police, who believed that it could be the breakthrough that they had been looking for. Matilda provided the police with a description of the car and of the man that she had seen. 
It's reported in newspapers at the time that Detective Chief Superintendent Eric Rundle described some of the details of what she'd seen. He described the car as a deep maroon colour, well kept and had a good shine. It was a medium-sized saloon car which had bodywork that was similar to a Triumph make. It could have also had a beige stripe along the side of it. The driver was reportedly between 18 and 25 years of age and had thick, blackish, short hair. He looked tidy with a pale complexion and apparently wore a light-coloured shirt. An artist's impression of the man seen was created and police began trying to search for him. Rundle stated at the time, We're anxious to trace the vehicle which is known to have passed along the lane at the material time between 3 o'clock and 3.45. Despite extensive inquiries, we've failed to locate this man and I now ask that he come forward as he may have vital information for us. This sighting was important, however one thing to note about Matilda Rogers' description is that some of the details came out after hypnosis, to try and draw out more precise parts. For investigators, however, this was their strongest lead so far, and so they placed lots of resources into trying to trace this man down, as he had been at the scene at the time that Jeanette and the girls had passed by. At the end of that month, Jeanette's family and the community continued to appeal for answers despite not locating any sign of her. Reverend Derek Large, rector at the Cliss St George Rectory, around five miles from Aylesbury, took part in a vigil for Jeanette and told the press that he intended to stay by the phone in case the person responsible for her disappearance phoned up. He stated on the 30th of August, I shall stay by the phone for 24 hours from noon today. If you telephone, I shall answer. No one else will be listening. Just tell me if Jeanette is still alive and give me the proof if she is. If she is dead, then tell me, and if you can, where her body may be found. I do not want to know your name or where you are. I only want to end the terrible strain and distress which Jeanette's parents are suffering. Jeanette's mum Sheila echoed this, stating, None of us have given up hope by any means, but it is a tremendous strain. The community came together to try and figure out what had happened to Jeanette, and the press also featured her prominently in many of their articles. The mystery of the teenager who simply vanished off the lane that day captured the attention of many people, and nobody could quite understand what had happened and where she had gone. This was reflected in many of the stories about her disappearance, and her face was shown in national coverage. Over the following few weeks, police and the family appealed and more rescue teams were sent in to try and locate Jeanette, but without success. Jeanette's stepmother Violet described how the family was feeling after she had been missing for 67 days. She said, Some days you don't feel like getting up and other days you're full of hope. If a car stops or there is a bang in the middle of the night, both of us jump up in case it's Jeanette coming back. The not knowing is the hardest thing, and that was exactly what the Tate family were going through. A reward fund was set up for information, and by October it was decided that this would be capped at £23,000. This was decided as it was thought that someone was withholding information about Jeanette in the hope that the fund would increase. Interest in Jeanette's case was not waning, which was a good thing for the publicity of her disappearance, however this also attracted some unusual characters. The investigation was plagued by hoax callers, including one caller who demanded a thousand pounds, saying that he had Jeanette. He reportedly said, I have got her, we want a thousand pounds in cash, I will never see her again. She's with my brother in a barn nearby. The man had made a phone call to an open phone line that the police department had set up. When the man rang up again, the police were able to trace the call from the phone used to a phone box close to Chester Town Hall. The call had been a hoax, and the man pled guilty to making two calls for the purpose of annoyance. This was a horrid thing for Jeanette's family, and it was described as sick by the chairman of the bench. Another prominent feature of the case was the many psychics and mediums that came forward to say that they knew about what happened to Jeanette. This was a popular theory, particularly during that time, and many of these psychics were featured in articles about her disappearance. 
Some of these hypotheses were related to areas that she might have been buried, and some even talked about the fact that Jeanette may have been abducted by aliens. These theories were of course discounted by the police, and Jeanette's family were also involved, as some of these people would turn up at their home to try and tell them where she was. This was unwanted by the Tate family, as it just added unnecessary anguish to their already horrific situation. John Tate reportedly labelled some of these theories as a load of rubbish. While a lot of the information from mediums was dismissed by the police, they did decide to bring in Gerard Crosset to help find Jeanette. Gerard Crosset was a Dutch parapsychologist and psychic who had been working with Dutch authorities since after the Second World War on missing person cases and unsolved murders. He gained international attention in 1966 when he was asked to consult on the Beaumont children disappearance where Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont went missing after visiting an Adelaide beach in Australia. His information didn't lead to their recovery and they are still missing. In 1970, he consulted on the disappearance of Muriel Mackay, which is a case we've covered on this podcast. Her body was never recovered, however people were convicted for her murder. During the 1970s, Crosset continued to consult on cases, and some said that he had provided important information. However, since then, this has been disputed, with police forces coming out to say that they had found missing people or solved murders without the help of Crosset. He was taken out to Aylesbury, and he looked at maps to see if he could feel where Jeanette was. This was reportedly his method, and when driving around, he did ask police to stop at a quarry and said that there had been a killing. He later stated that this killing was in the future, and it wasn't Jeanette. This was one of the frustrating things about Crosset, was that he couldn't pinpoint a specific murder at a specific time. He also talked about a pond that Jeanette may have been in, but police did not locate anything. Crosset's advice had not led to Jeanette's discovery, and there was still none the wiser as to where she was. This focus on mediums did take up an awful lot of valuable time and it was reported that by the end of 1978, almost a 100 mediums had contacted police. As 1978 turned into 1979, police continued to try and find leads, however it was proving difficult. They really didn't have a lot to go on, and the lack of evidence caused the investigation to falter over the next several months. They were convinced that somebody must have abducted her along her journey, but who did this and where they were now was a mystery. They only had the one sighting of the man in the maroon car, and his description had been enhanced by hypnosis of Matilda Rogers. Jeanette's family never stopped searching, and they tried as hard as they could to keep her name and face in the press. Her story had initially gained a lot of media attention, but like every case that remains unsolved, after several months that began to wane slightly. In May 1979, it was reported that John and Violet Tate told the press that they wanted to set up a charity called International Find a Child that would help others with advice if this happened to them. It was clear that they knew the heartache of having a missing child and they wanted to help others. John also wrote a book about Jeanette called Jeanette is Missing. He explained that he hoped this would encourage people to come forward with a fresh lead. The first year anniversary of her disappearance came around in August 1979 and a new photograph from John's book was circulated to the media. This photograph showed Jeanette as slightly more mature and more like she was when she went missing. It was featured in national newspapers and officers went to Aylesbury to interview holiday makers in the hope that one of them had been there the year prior and might remember something. Chief Constable John Alderson spoke to the Sunday Mirror for an exclusive interview in August, as part of the anniversary push for Leeds. He explained that their main lead was still the man in the maroon car, but described the lead as thin as a thread of cotton. He told the paper that they needed more information about it. He stated that they believed the car was an old Triumph Herald or a Toledo. Through hypnosis, it was believed that the registration number was BM1G or MB1G. However, 19,000 vehicles with similar number plates were checked, and 20 were red or maroon. All of these, however, were eliminated. 
Despite this, Chief Constable Alderson appealed to the public if they knew anyone who was driving a maroon car in that area at the time to contact him. Chief Constable Alderson stated that Detective Superintendent Rundle in charge of the investigation was indebted to the 7,000 people who helped to search for Jeanette and explained that the investigation had so far cost £1 million. The fact that 7,000 local people had taken the time to help search for Jeanette shows how affected they were by her disappearance and indicates a close-knit community. Alderson appealed for anyone with information to come forward and stressed that there was a £35,000 reward. He also encouraged people to cut out the article and had asked the paper to put perforated lines around the outside of it so that people could put it in their windows so that Jeanette was not forgotten. It was hoped by spreading her story far and wide, someone would come forward. Unfortunately, as happens so frequently in cold cases, the attention around her disappearance slowly began to halt. The investigation had hit a dead end. Nobody had seen Jeanette, nobody came forward with names of suspects, and nobody reported anything suspicious. Once again, in so many disappearances, it was as though she had vanished. Years began to pass with people still wondering what could have happened to Jeanette and where she was. As the years went by, police scaled down the investigation, and sadly the awful possibility that something had happened to her began to be the prevailing theory. It's reported that police continued to follow up on any leads that came in during the next ten years, including travelling to Australia to track down a promising tip about someone who may have been involved and had since emigrated. This lead, however, didn't pan out, and it didn't progress the case any further. Over the years as anniversaries came and went, the hope that Jeanette's case would get solved continued to dwindle. However, police explained that they were still appealing for tips and would investigate anything that came in. As the 1990s came around, there was suddenly a new name that began to be associated with the case. Robert Black was on the radar of officers after some potential links were found to his convictions. Robert Black was a convicted serial killer and sex offender who had extensive convictions for child sexual assault starting as early as the late 50s. He was from Stirlingshire in Scotland and had had a troubled childhood, being in foster care since his birth and then being placed in children's homes. Here he had been known to expose himself to other students and began assaulting the other children. His first official conviction came at the age of 16 when he assaulted a seven-year-old girl and lured her into an abandoned air raid shelter. He wasn't arrested for this as it was believed to be an isolated incident. It would turn out that this was completely incorrect. In the village of Stowe in the Scottish borders in 1990, he was arrested for the attempted abduction and assault of a six-year-old girl. He was caught after a neighbour saw the girl's feet disappear from underneath the door of a blue transit van, which had stopped by the road. The neighbour got the registration number and the police were able to trace the van and intercept it. They found the girl in the back. She had been assaulted, but was alive. The driver was arrested and he was found to be Robert Black. In his van, they found a number of incriminating things, including ropes, a mattress and a Polaroid camera. Black attempted to brush off the assault as a sudden rush of blood to the head, saying he was going to let her go, but detectives soon found that he was a major suspect in many other abductions and killings. Black worked for a company called Poster Dispatch and Storage Limited, and his job role as a van driver was to travel around the country and across Europe delivering posters and billboard adverts. This meant that he would often stop off in small towns and villages and was very knowledgeable about many of the UK's roads. This is what officers would narrow in on during their investigation of several missing and murdered children across the country. Investigators had already been looking at the abduction and murders of two young girls, 11-year-old Susan Maxwell from Cornhill-on-Tweed on the English side of the border with Scotland in 1982 and five-year-old Caroline Hogg from Edinburgh in 1983. It's reported that these murders were connected as both girls were found quite far away from where they were abducted. 
Susan Maxwell was found beside the A518 in Staffordshire, and Caroline Hogg's body was found by the M1 motorway in Twycross in Leicestershire. The fact that they had been discovered off a main road and motorway led police to believe the suspect was the same and that it could be a lorry or delivery driver. Detectives accessed all of Robert Black's expenses that had been logged by the company on his journeys across the country and they discovered that not only was he in the areas at the time of these two abductions, they could also link him to other murders. Police spotted that he'd been in the Marley area of Leeds when 10-year-old Sarah Jane Harper was abducted from the street in 1986. Her body was found over 70 miles away in Nottingham. From his receipt submitted to the company, officers found that Black had stopped for petrol not far from the site of her body that day. An attempted abduction of 15-year-old Teresa Thornhill also occurred in 1988 in Radford in Nottinghamshire. A man later confirmed as Black attempted to bundle Teresa into the back of his van, but Teresa fought hard and bit him, causing him to loosen his grip. Teresa's boyfriend was also nearby and he helped fight him off. It was thought as Teresa was only 4 feet 11, Black thought she was younger. Detectives put together that these had been part of a series of murders and that there was only one perpetrator. After Black's arrest for the attempted abduction of the young girl in Stowe in 1990, detectives pored over his work records and decided that Black was their man, charging him with the murders of Susan Maxwell, Caroline Hogg, Sarah Jane Harper and the attempted abduction of Teresa Thornhill. He was convicted on all counts in 1994 and sentenced to three concurrent life sentences. In 2009, there was another conviction added, the murder of Jennifer Cardi in 1981 in Northern Ireland. Nine-year-old Jennifer Cardi had been riding her bicycle in County Antrim when she was abducted and murdered by Robert Black. Her body was later found 16 miles from her home, while her bike had been hidden by branches and leaves where she had been taken. Once again, her body had been found not far from an area used by long-distance lorry drivers. Receipts from his employer once again found that Black had been in the area at the time of her abduction and matched the MO in his other cases. Black was convicted of Jennifer Cardi's murder and another life sentence was added to his other sentences. Robert Black died in 2016 from a heart attack while in prison. After his death, police across the country had to consider whether Black could have been involved with any of their unsolved disappearances and murders of children in their areas. It was known that he travelled across the country and in several cases had abducted children off the streets during daylight hours. These cases were so hard to investigate as it was as though they had vanished. In the cases that Black was convicted of, the bodies of his victims had been discovered. However, had there been more cases where victims had simply disappeared without being found yet? This was a distinct possibility, and one that officers in 1994 came together to discuss. They talked about which cases should be looked at in relation to Black. One of these cases was Jeanette's. There are several similarities between Black's other victims and Jeanette's disappearance. She vanished from a public place in the middle of the day, and just her bicycle was left behind. This is exactly what happened to Jennifer Cardi, just three years after Jeanette's disappearance. Something striking is that while Jennifer's murder was thought to be officially Black's first abduction, Jeanette's bicycle had not been moved from the scene and it became a prominent part of the publicity campaign around her disappearance. In Jennifer's abduction, the bicycle was covered up with branches and leaves, as though to disguise the fact that she had disappeared from that spot. It's certainly not beyond the realms of possibility that Robert Black was there during that time, and police believe that he could and may have committed similar crimes before abducting Jennifer Cardi. It's reported in Devon Live that police found amongst his receipts evidence that he was in the southwest at the time, and there was also a witness who possibly saw Black at Exeter Airport acting suspiciously on August the 19th, the day of Jeanette's disappearance. Robert Black has consistently been linked to Jeanette's case. However, like many other cases, both in the UK and across Europe, that he has been connected to, no one is sure that he had anything to do with it. The man seen in the maroon car has always been a prominent lead and a mystery and causes some doubt as to who actually committed this crime. 
Jeanette's father, John Tate, told Devon Live that while he once thought Black could have been responsible, he changed his mind. He stated, I don't believe Robert Black murdered her. I don't think he had anything to do with it. Devon and Cornwall police are convinced he did it. They don't have any circumstantial evidence, just what he's done in the past, that's all. Devon and Cornwall police reportedly gave John information from a 500-page dossier on why Black was their main suspect and the killer. Sadly, Jeanette's father died in May 2020 in Manchester after suffering several different ailments, including a stroke and prostate cancer. John died not knowing what happened to Jeanette, despite dedicating his life to keeping her image and story alive. In a statement that he made in 2018, it's clear how much he wanted Jeanette found and to finally get answers. He stated, My life is coming to an end. I dearly want to know where Ginny is. Just to know that she's been found and given a Christian burial is enough. I could go to my grave in the knowledge that we were together again. There is no closure. We will probably never have closure, especially now the only suspect is dead. I'm not 100% sure that Black did it. But if he didn't do it, it means there's another killer still on the loose. I suppose I just don't want to accept that she is dead. But I need proof that Black killed her. If we could just find her body, that would give me the proof I need. It's tragic that John Tate died without knowing for sure what happened to Jeanette. And while the police may believe that it is Robert Black, it's fair to say that there is not concrete proof that that is the case, as without finding her, it's difficult to say for certain what happened. Devon and Cornwall police were reportedly preparing a murder prosecution against Robert Black at the time of his death and it's clear that they believe he is their prime suspect in the murder. In 2017, residents in the neighbourhood of Wedlands in Taunton, Somerset, received letters stating that Jeanette is buried in one of their gardens. This was frightening to receive for the community, and the letters also contained some accusations against the police's investigation. Jeanette had actually lived in Wedlands during an earlier part of her life, however police dismissed the letters as not credible and stated that they knew the author of the letters and they would be spoken to in due time. There has been little published since Jeanette's father's death last year, and it's unclear if police are following any other lines of inquiry or if anyone is actively working on Jeanette's case. Like many unsolved and older cases, however, there are always a lot more questions than answers. Where did Jeanette go that day? Did someone abduct her? How did they get down the lane without being spotted by several people? Did the man in the maroon car have anything to do with it? Did Robert Black commit the abduction of Jeanette? As well as Jeanette, there are many other odd and strange disappearances of children, and one in particular that is often linked to hers due to the similarities. Next episode, we will be looking at a specific case that is regularly connected to hers, the disappearance of April Fab. Thank you for listening to this episode. I want to credit Devon Live for their coverage of this case and their podcast about Jeanette's disappearance. It's called The Disappearance of Jeanette Tate and I will link it in the show notes. Thank you as always to my Patreon supporters, I couldn't do it without you. If you would like to support the podcast and get some extras like bonus episodes, ad-free early access, stickers and shoutouts then click the link in the show notes. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can review it wherever you listen and you can also follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or subscribe on YouTube. Please share the episodes as that one listener may hold the key to some of these cases. If you're interested in coming to CrimeCon in September, remember you can get 10% off the ticket using my code UNSEEN. I would love to see you all there. As always, I'm Caprice and this has been UNSEEN.
Hello. Hello. I'm Tom. And I'm Andrea. And we're the hosts of We Drink and We Know Things. The podcast. We're a husband and wife comedy show. We cover all kinds of stuff from UFOs to cryptids. We also cover a lot of true crime and some paranormal. And we do it all while getting drunk. Yeah, we sit in our office, we have a good time, and we have some drinks. Every month we put out bonus episodes. We give you some cool stuff like creepy pastas and the glitch in the matrix. So be sure to come and hang out with us. We're a weekly podcast. Doused in alcohol. And lit with knowledge. Clinkies! Clinkies.